uh, looking forward to, which is on the Ring of Steel. Let's hear about it. Thanks very much. I'll start uh, uh, with the presentation of our ongoing research in this uh, terrain, and then John Young will join us for a, an open discussion later on. New York City has one remaining active military camp, that's Brooklyn's Fort Hamilton, a historic sentry poised along the mild white wide gateway into New York Harbor, the Verrazano Narrows. Control of this strategic choke point confirmed the 19th century city's investment in strong point dominance, collateral to New York's emerging status in world trade. But there were always back doors into the urban system, exploited by anonymous flows of mobile bodies wayfarer, immigrant, and contrarian thinkers that would become reconstituted as a body politic in the city's places of public assembly. Fort Hamilton became obsolete after the Civil War as evolving defense technologies changed the geographic scale of warfare. In this decade, Fort Hamilton's operations have included processing expeditionary forces bound for overseas missions. Today, in the polyglot waterfront neighborhoods that have historically surrounded Fort Hamilton, local police reconstruct the choke point through militarized technologies for local command, control, communications, computers, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. The US Army Center of Military History runs the Harbor Defense Museum located in Fort Hamilton's Granite Caponier, a freestanding bastion inside the Vobanian style fort completed in 1831. The military museum's Hobbesian scripts and triumphalist militaria articulate theories of national power as they celebrate the defense of metropolitan harbor and city. Museum scripts confirm the choke point as the privileged strong point within the system of enclosures that shape the historic conception of the ordered city. In that venerable schema, Urban order originated in acts of inclusion and exclusion, which distinguished the city's inside and its sovereign subjects from its outside, the realm of the outlaw. Disciplinary enclosure was the sovereign act that delimited urban order from ex-urban chaos. The sovereign himself rarely approached his domain through the back doors of the system. The Harbor Defense Museum's information warfare was breached on 9-11 and the choke point exploited when United Airlines Flight 175 overflew the Narrows on its way to crashing into the World Trade Center's South Tower. The rupture ushered in a new security geography for metropolitan police, new interdictory architectures for choke points, checkpoints, watchtowers, and watch lists imposed sovereign discipline on expanding scales of the fluid harbor city. The New York Police Department's One Police Plaza Security Plan and its Lower Manhattan Security Initiative, dubbed Rings of Steel by the obliging media, are nested infrastructures whose processes enforce the Choke Point Sovereign Act, distinguishing between sovereign subject and outlaw. Ring of Steel sensing and reporting ar armatures are distributed south of Canal Street in Lower Manhattan's critical landscapes of courthouses, high finance, and legacy telecom hubs. The security apparatus aspires to the invisibility, ubiquity, and permanence of ordinary black boxed infrastructure, normalized as an uncontested given in multi-layered urban terrain. Ours is being called the urban century. Over 50% of the world's population now live in cities. 75% will live in cities by 2050. Urbanization is becoming globally integrated. New York City is classified as a global city, along with London, Paris, Tokyo, and other dominant hubs within globalized capitalism, where material circuits cycle across scales from local to regional to national and beyond transnational. Global urban integration is being built on complex infrastructures and multi-scale flows and mobility systems, vast technological circuits and processes that sustain urban metabolisms down to the individual body. The security city tracks malign flows that might introduce risk into the global system by exploiting back doors and trap doors of critical infrastructures. 
Geographer Steve Graham has traced the profound consequences of disruptions to interconnected, mutually dependent infrastructure systems, whether caused by state or non-state political violence, or simply technical failure that is always imminent in large techno systems. We've seen cascading infrastructures failures take down complex, mutually dependent assemblages, a non-linear cascading disruption of digital controls, power grids, transport networks, global financial systems, global telephony. John Young and I are brick and mortar architects in this city where very old legacy systems are being interleaved with these new infrastructural technologies. It is a city of powerful symbols and discourses as well as materialities and of avid symbolic production in realms of culture, ideas, information, and theater. Cryptome was founded in 1996 as a bottom-up repository of documents in a city of magnificent top-down libraries. Cryptome has been constructed as a transparent public project, a civic project, focused on emerging technologies, emerging politics of information, and their inchoate back doors. The Ring of Steel's choke pointing infrastructure hardened the city through an assemblage of street closures, manned checkpoint booths, hydraulically operated delta barriers, sally ports, jersey barriers, license plate readers, bollards, reinforced planters, surveillance cameras, and explosive trace detection devices. This urban hardware continually funnels choke pointing sensing and reporting data to sovereign command and control databases of the NYPD domain awareness system, a network counterterrorism tool invested in omniscient ideals of the technological sublime. The police inform us that the domain awareness system, quote, facilitates the observation of pre-operational activity by terrorist organizations and their agents. Sanctioned by putative states of emergency, the domain awareness system produces the city's pre-operational data double. This model of the risky public domain is mobilized through hypervigilance, risk profiling, the watch list. In this urban model, the state of emergency's doctrines of preemption reclassify the public domain as threatscape, a pre-operational zone requiring continual aggressive inspection. The pre-operational threatscape consolidates the police department's definition of the public domain as a place where, quote, no legally protected reasonable expectation of privacy exists, end quote. The domain awareness system confirms the Ring of Steel's enforcement of the threatscape as the ultimate sovereign exclusion. No legally protected reasonable expectation of privacy exists in spaces where bodies pol politic assemble to perform transparent choreographies of public democracy. The Ring of Steel is dedicated to the new utopia of an anonymity-free city where each sovereign subject is identified and every outlaw tracked in perpetuity. The domain awareness system may or may not make allowances for the urban system's back doors and trap doors. The spectacular disruptions of 9-11 introduced a strident political theater of critical infrastructure protection focused on infrastructures that serve large techno systems within the global corporate economy. Security theater has emerged as a dominant pageant in the global city. Ritualized security performances that dramatize states of heightened alert co-op public space as their stage at the same time as they censure choreographies of public assembly. The NYPD Hercules teams, special forces type heavily armed units bearing armor plated vests and nine millimeter submachine guns regularly swarm the city in a pantomime of mobile mil militarized power. Only the NYPD's famously extra big bellies betray the contours of a decidedly not special forces physique. Let's call them special forces on donuts. Philosophical partners to the Hercules teams are the roving stop and frisk squads that strip anonymity from youth and adults who assemble in the public domain where no legally protected reasonable expectation of privacy exists. Of 700,000 stopped last year, 87% were black and Latino. We propose the, the urban network of places of public assembly is in fact a critical infrastructure of democratic process and critical infrastructure protection is a civic obligation. With a choke point at the Verrazano Narrows long rendered obsolete, NYPD enforces the urban century sovereign enclosures by also mobilizing a version of preemptive stop and frisk at global scale. 
The department's intelligence division, manned by a former senior CIA official, was ramped up after 9-11 into the country's most powerful police intelligence entity. Now the Ring of Steel's offshore perimeter is patrolled by officers of the International Liaison Program who are embedded in police counter-terror departments of overseas host cities, Montreal, Toronto, Santo Domingo, London, Paris, Lyon, Madrid, Tel Aviv, Amman, Abu Dhabi, Singapore. The International Liaison Program, whose budget is unknown, lies beyond the reach of any oversight. It is funded by private donations to the private New York City Police Foundation, which also funds the NYPD Counterterrorism Operations Center. The International Liaison Program operates outside the authority of US officials abroad, whether the US ambassador or CIA station chief. Nor do the Director of National Intelligence or the Department of Homeland Security have any jurisdiction over the NYPD program. The police department insists it will police itself, pointing out that national intelligence and national defense failed to protect the city on 9-11. The global city's municipal processes continue to bypass the national scale. The very locution domain awareness system echoes military nomenclature like the Department of Defense's concept of full spectrum dominance. These rhetorical flourishes reflect the effort to get on top of the global information environment, just as they reflect the increasing militarization of policing worldwide in discourse, practice, hardware, and software. The scale and technologies of global policing are, collab are uh, rather, the domain awareness system is faced with the operational and interoperability challenges of militarized C4ISR architectural frameworks for command, control, computers, communications, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. The scales and technologies of global policing are collapsing into the finer granularities of our local places. Doctrines of preemption are checkpoints that engage risk profiling and anticipatory surveillance for continual classification of risky versus safe local spaces and risky versus safe local mobilities that flow through immigrant places of public assembly. As in the case of legacy cryptography, linguistic codes are treated as munitions in a hardened sanctuary city. NYPD's famous linguists are skilled in over 60 languages, including Arabic, Pashto, Urdu, and Kurdish. Linguists are recruited from diasporic neighborhoods where risky mobilities are thought to predominate. Lost in translation, police linguists obligingly target their own immigrant communities. The spectacular demolitions of 9-11 provoked a politicized culture of fear that fetishizes states of emergency and mass spectacles. Preemptive security theater anticipates cascading disaster and apocalyptic collapse. However, ex existential threat is assigned to some calamities but not to others. For instance, public safety is invoked urgently but public health remains at risk. There is little concern about destruction to communities that is the collateral damage of the prison industry's mass epidemic of incarceration described as a public health catastrophe by public health scholar Ernest Druck, Drucker in his recent book, A Plague of Prisons. In the politicized narratives of security theater, morbidity is a relative existential crisis. Subscribers to premium services are always granted existential priority. The historic choke point is superseded by watchtower-like interdictory architectures that scan the waterfront's immigrant neighborhoods. 762 detainees were held on immigration charges at the Federal Metropolitan Detention Center, Brooklyn, in mass sweeps connected with the investigation of September 11 attacks. By 2003, the Department of Justice Office of Inspector General had concluded that conditions at the MDC were excessively restrictive and unduly harsh. The discipline of the choke point had been supplanted by the discipline of the choke hold. We want to shift now in scale, to scale down to local granularity, to capture a recent instance of urban intersections that offer nuance to the broader security frameworks described to this point. Our granular investigation of the city is genealogical, archeological, as well as programmatic. Our excavation hopes to delaminate layers of a highly symbolic, symbolic zone, the Lower Manhattan Civic Center, that frames the city's pre presumed juridical conscience. 
The Civic Center is also concurrently the symbolic command and control epicenter of the rings of steel. Are there inherent conflicts in this programmatic duality? In this global century, our excavation of the Civic Center reminds us of the historic continuities that inform places of urban change and transformation, and also reminds us of the need to continually renew urban strategies to support a robust public domain. The body politic as a public assembly continually reconstitutes the public domain of the city. What are new civic, civic strategies for the global city's evolving urban politics given the trend towards privatization that markets premium services and premium spaces for privileged consumers at the expense of arenas for performances of small d democracy, debate, and dissent? This past January, Occupy the Courts petitioned the General Services Administration, the GSA, the agency that manages federal properties, for a permit to rally during a national day of protest against the Supreme Court's Citizen United ruling. Occupy proposed assembling the Lower Manhattan in the, the Lower Manhattan Civic Center at the front steps of the Moynihan Federal Courthouse at 500 Pearl Street. When GSA denied the requested permit, Occupy made an emergency appeal to the federal courts. Transcripts of those proceedings are available on Cryptome. Occupy plaintiffs put forward a fairly simple urban proposition that went to the heart of the idea of civic assembly as a robust manifestation of the public domain. Quote, because of the nature of this protest, it's very important that a group of people be allowed to gather outside the courthouse. As architects, however, we note that a fairly minimal urban analysis of the Occupy rally site was offered during court arguments. Today, we hope to provide a more substantive exploration of that compel compelling urban terrain. In this urban century, we look to the site as an instructive case study of the status of the public domain in the glo global city. A declaration by the U.S. Marshal Service stating the Moynihan Courthouse was a terrorist target played a crucial road role in Judge Louis A. Kaplan's denial of Occupy's request for a rally permit at the courthouse front steps. Judge Kaplan also concluded the area in front of the main entrance of Moynihan could not legally be considered a public forum. In concluding the site should be classified as a terrorist target rather than a public forum, the court censured the public domain, giving precedence to the targeting list of a non-state military, endowing that targeting list with the authority of a rogue urban master planning document. This capitulation by civic center authorities, this instance of civic eraser, erasure of the public domain, was no less significant than an erasure by ballistic means. The site of the censured rally lies within the federal complex under jurisdiction of U.S. Federal Protective Services and U.S. Marshals. The complex includes two federal courthouses, offices of the U.S. Attorney, and a pretrial detention center. Most importantly, the, tr the site is served by the continual flow of jurors percolating through courthouse processes from their source, the New York State Jury Pool, a comprehensive list drawn from five state databases. The unimpeded flow of juror bodies is the site's crucial democratic natural resource. The problems of ethnic disparity in New York juries makes the unimpeded flow of a variegated jury pool all the more urgent. Prospective jurors called for service do not enter the Moynihan Courthouse through the front door entrance cited by Occupy at their as their preferred rally site, however. Rather, jurors enter through the courthouse's secondary entrance at 200 Worth Street. This back door to the courthouse system is of particular interest to us today. The jurors' back door introduces an urban dialectic, a contrasting politics of the city's front doors and its back doors. Interleave juris jurisdictions are typical of urban complexity. The Civic Center's federal complex nests within another jurisdictional perimeter centered on police headquarters at one police plaza. Delineated after 1999 and hardened after 9-11 as a special police security zone. This zone contains a courthouse of the New York State system, a prominent municipal structure, several residential housing complexes, a high school, a commercial data center. Because of its mixed-use urban complexity, the enclave lends itself to being studied as a paradigmatic security prototype. Embedded in this paradigmatic urban kernel are codes for a reproducible urban security typology, urban codes with serious implications for the public domain. 
NYPD assures that pedestrian access within the security perimeter established by the checkpoints and the delta barriers is not restricted. We might ask whether access to a landscape circumscribed by checkpoints and delta barriers can ever be characterized as not restricted. This question is particular urgency given the ideal of a variegated jury pool's unencumbered flow through an impartial civic environment where blindfolded justice and her scales risk being challenged by the allegory of the chokehold. In January 2012, Occupy the Courts had ventured into the Ring of Steel's putative command and control core. This colonel was more than the Rust Belt street apparatus of man checkpoint booths, hydraulically operated delta barriers, and reinforced planters. New technologies are the critical underpinnings of the domain awareness system, as has been touted in the past year with a fanfare surrounding completion of the new Joint Operations Command Center adjacent to police headquarters. The JOC is described as a 24-7 centralized, fully integrated command and control facility that provides oversight of critical emergency functions. Its centrality in public relations prominence deftly offset the covert operations of the NYPD Counterterrorism counter Operations Center, secreted at an undisclosed location in an outer borough, some suggest along the Brooklyn waterfront at Sunset Park. The RFP issued to construction management firms bidding on the Joint Operations Center project describes general architectural requirements culminating in a double height emergency operations command floor. Sensitive technologies that support the domain awareness system are only alluded to in this document, however. If the police security zone can be thought of as a prototype urban security kernel whose codes may be reproduced and scaled up into a new urban security typology with grave consequences for the public domain and places of public assembly, it is of interest to note the JOC is not the security zone's only data hub. Close relations between law enforcement and private data farms are unfolding at the former Verizon Telephone Building, 140 yards south of police headquarters, being converted by the SABI Corp of Seattle into the Intergate Manhattan Data Center. The Verizon Building is one of Lower Manhattan's five or so legacy telephone switching hubs, of which three have purportedly in part or fully been converted into data hubs. These hubs lie at the core of the vast telecom infrastructure that te sustains New York City's status as a global city within the global system. SABI Corp is not concerned by the Verizon building's adjacency to NYPD command and control node 140 yards away. Rather than assuring clients that adequate firewalls separate police systems from the center's own data troves, SABI's marketing pitch mobilizes critical infrastructure protection narratives and promises special access to premium security service to be rendered in part it is intimated by law enforcement. Clients are ensured that the new facility is, quote, secured within the boundaries of one police plaza, guarded by NYPD and Homeland Security personnel. This is an eye-opening pitch. It is not clear whether any of SABI's supposedly unrivaled $50 million of perimeter security has been in the form of donations to the private New York City Police Foundation that funds both the International Liaison Program and the Counterterrorism Operations Center. Private investments are beyond the reach of any watchdog or oversight. With its advertised close relations to NYPD and DHS, can we doubt SABI is providing New York City's ultimate anonymity-free data center? Such relationships will be the status quo in urban security enclaves modeled on the particular prototype we're exploring today. Cybersecurity keywords that recently appeared in a DHS document exposed the sovereign's voracious ongoing search for actionable text. If SABI was nonplussed by its data center being circumscribed within the security zone, two 1960s era housing complexes trapped within the prototype enclave were not so sanguine. The 450-unit Chatham Green and 240-unit Chatham Towers, housing many Chinese Americans from the Chinatown community adjacent, filed suit against New York City in 2003, seeking relief from the zone's onerous security measures. In the one police plaza security zone kernel prototype, 
The, the gradual encroaching of counter-terror security model against urban housing expands the scope of what sociologist Lois Wacan has referred to as the prisonization of social housing, that is, the increasing use of practices and apparatuses of the prison industrial complex to contain urban housing, especially public housing, just as stop and frisk pra practices contain the public domain. The resistance mobilized by the Chatham residents is an instructive act of public assembly supporting the public domain. With a prototype security enclave, the Chatham Towers and Chatham Green had been absorbed within the incarcerative continuum whose most restrictive pole is of the Metropolitan Correctional Center west of Moynihan Courthouse, which holds federal pretrial and holdover inmates, including high visibility terrorist sub suspects. This continuum of incarcerative typologies is expanding from the hardened architecture of Lower Manhattan's various detention facilities to prisonized housing complexes captured within special security zones. Ernest Drucker's epidemiological mappings of urban incarceration provide a chilling report on the status of communities that are effectively networked to harden prison space. The book's striking cover photo captures the squeeze of the sovereign's chokehold. The Ring of Steel's mobile forms of control and regulation are also deploying emerging present prisonized typologies, including the sustained chokehold of New York City's on New York City's Muslim community. NYPD's prisonizing chokehold on Muslim New York is exacerbated by the case of so-called terrorist trials due to have taken place at Moynihan Courthouse. Here, security theater scripts supported the abdication of juridical processing, offshoring justice procedures to the uncontested show tribunals, or rather the untested show tribunals of Guantanamo. Guantanamo has effectively become the civic center's dark doppelganger. The prototype security enclave insists not only on the erasure of places of public assembly, but also the censure of crucial juridical processes that bypass the jury, the very symbol of the body politic and public assembly. As a result of the lawsuits by the Chatham Housing Complexes, NYPD was obliged to release an environmental impact statement that decrypted some general aspects of the Ring of Steel's prototype enclave. Diagrams of street closures and barrier systems remind us of the genealogical link with cities where the term ring of steel originated, Belfast of the 1980s and London of the 1990s, where security architectures was erected to counter IRA activity. The exporting of urban security practices from Belfast to London and then to New York serves as an example of the global diffusion of policing practices in which security apparatus is scaled up into a city fragment whose central programmatic function is in effect as a machine for sorting outlaws. This, of course, is an anonymity-free zone. The Chatham protests contributed to outcries about civil liberties implications of the rings of steel and the domain awareness system. NYPD responded by issuing public security privacy guidelines in 2009. Let's rename that document and its usual boilerplate, and do we have a Brooklyn Bridge to sell you? the usual stipulations of no person will be targeted or monitored solely because of actual or perceived race, uh, political beliefs. Data destroyed after the rel relevant period. Secondary use of data will be stringently uh, controlled. Amazingly, a period of public comment was allowed for response to the public security privacy guidelines. Comments sent by snail mail were to be mailed directly to the attention of the NYPD Counterterrorism Bureau at One Police Plaza. We can speculate just what dissenting public comments the Counterterrorism Bureau may have received. We may also speculate, absent anonymity, just what was done with identities of authors whose robust dissent may have reached the Counterterrorism Bureau's snail box deep within the security zone. Doctrines of preemption invoke putative states of emergency when they demand an anonymity-free city. In this preemption scenario, each of us residents is effectively issued 
an a priori, a digital mugshot just waiting to be toggled to the on position. Before John and the floor engage in what we hope will be stimulating conversation, we'd like to make one final detour through Midtown to our very own Hotel Pennsylvania. Hope 9 offers a useful venue to speculate about the boundaries of exclusion that divide sovereign subject from outlaws. Nowhere is more fitting than this 1919 structure designed by McKin, Mead, and White, preeminent architects of the turn of the 20th century's City Beautiful movement. In an era dominated by the colonial world order, City Beautiful promoted the city as an imperial scale metropolis. Exclusion was the dark subtext of City Beautiful's presumably democratic urban largesse. The City Beautiful movement emerged during the Gilded Age, determined to cleanse the bad morals and physical degradations of the tumultuous immigrant city. City Beautiful movement deployed architectural codes of academic neoclassicism as its urban lingua franca. The movement's ideals of the civic still have urban currency over a century later. It's productive for us to deconstruct the movement's civic codes in order to consider the front doors and back doors of its top-down civic systems. Hotel Pennsylvania was not an isolated artifact, but the terminus of a regional transportation infrastructure the Pennsylvania Railroad Network that culminated in Old Penn Station across 7th Avenue, which was demolished in the early 60s, and we're pleased to be in a space that commemorates Olive Dennis, a railway uh, engineer of this period, uh, first uh, female of her, of her kind. Um, one of the sto uh, one of the stone eagles that graced the original Penn Station can still be seen today on the perch uh, across the street, you know, sitting on its little granite pedestal. In the imperial metropolis, architecture, urban design, trains, train schedules, clocks, telegraphs were key technologies in enabling the world trade system. In Old Penn Station, McKim, Mead, and White's Bozar school training was embellished by their affinity for imperial Rome. Rome's public baths, We've lost our video. Rome's public baths provided architectural reference for the station's monumental interiors. Baths built by the emperors Caracalla, Titus, Diocletian, and Constantine had been vital themes of Roman urbanism. The baths were secular temples that functioned as cities within cities. Baths were public meeting places for the free use of citizens that brought Romans of every class together into an ambitious social, cultural, and hygienic environment. This rendering of the baths of Caracalla as they were in 2016 uh, shows how Old Penn Station was clearly a, a faithful recreation of the imperial prototype. City Beautiful's promise of top-down reform was heavily invested in exclusivity and the promise of front door access through the imperial facade. Imperial rhetoric was as asymmetrical as income inequality, however. The voice of the common man should only be raised to praise the captain of industry's philanthropic largesse. For those who doubted imperial Rome's baths would be su sufficient to cleanse the immigrant city's unwashed multitudes, grittier theories and practices of reform were vigorously pursued. A key reformer was immigrant philanthropist Jacob Rees, author of the influential expose, How the Other Half Lives. The power of photography taken through the back doors of the city exposed the front door asymmetries of City Beautiful's Grand Manor urbanism. Reese's photography advanced his efforts to develop more organic solutions to the crisis of the 19th century immigrant city, including model housing to supplant the crowded tenements of rag pickers, child laborers, and, in, and high infant mortality rates. The term robber baron came into use around 1890 to describe the captains of industry who, like philanthropist Andrew Carnegie, our bearded steel baron at center, were patrons of the City Beautiful's top-down approach. Captains of industry may have been called robber barons, but mansion-studded Fifth Avenue was celebrated as Millionaire's Row. Andrew Carnegie's Fifth Avenue pile is today's Cooper Hewitt Museum of, Deni of Design. It was not on Millionaire's Row, but in the city of the unwashed, 
multitudes where a particular urban place could be criminalized a priori. This was the case with Bandit's Roost and other places of public assembly in the tumultuous immigrant neighborhood of the Five Points, again photographed by Reese. Just a couple block, blocks north of the epicenter of the Ring of Steel. Reese's name was given to the Jacob Reese's houses in the Lower East ha Side in tribute to his efforts to improve housing stock. You may recognize the Reese houses as the residence of Sabu, who was run by the FBI from apartment 6F at 90 Avenue D while his parents were in prison on drug charges. Hardly a uh, enviable conclusion to, uh, to Reese's e efforts to reform the city. The New York Police Charter recalled the turbulence of bandit routes in the Five Points neighborhood when it granted plenary powers to the police department and underscored the need to regulate da dangerous assemblages. After the erasure, erasure of the Five Points, the Civic Center adopted the architectural codes of academic neoclassicism to embody themes of unimpeachable juridical virtue. The border between sovereign subject and outlaw became demarcated by monumental Corinthian capitals, acanthus leaves, and classical revival rotundas. The Moynihan U.S. Courthouse was the largest in the country when it was completed in 1994. The po its postmodern style collaborated with a neoclassical context. On the right, the view from Foley Square shows how, despite not actually fronting on the square, the architects integrated Mo Moynihan into the frontality of neoclassical facades of New York State Supreme Court at left and Thurgood Marshall uh, Courthouse, U.S. Courthouse at, at right. The tight space at the entrance of Moynihan Courthouse that Occupy had selected for their censured rally is located deep in the slot between the two old, uh, older monumental courthouses. By proposing to assemble at Moynihan's front steps, Occupy was addressing neoclassical assumptions about the symbolic primacy of monumental front doors. Could Occupy's rally have engaged a more compelling urban matrix? We want to consider this question as we conclude here with an archaeological dig an archaeology that exposes not Moynihan's front door, but its back door, that juror's entrance at 200 Worth Street de described earlier. Approach from Brooklyn Bridge, we find the occupied protest site underpinned by a compelling history. Excavations confirm the Moynihan Courthouse was built on the foundations of the Five Points, the 19th century immigrant neighborhood that was the focus of Reese's reform efforts. An obligatory archaeological study was undertaken during the construction of the Moynihan in the early 90s in the location of the underground prison transit tunnel that linked Moynihan to the Metropolitan Correctional Center, the pretrial detention facility. The archaeological dig yielded some 850,000 objects from 18th and 19th century tanneries, saloons, and residences of the Five Points neighborhood. Ceramic pitchers, bowls, teaware, liquor bottles, spittoons were destined for museum exhibit. The GSA stored the artifacts pending their eventual public display. Unfortunately, the GSA storeroom had to be, happened to be located in the basement of Number 6 World Trade Center. None of the 850,000 artifacts survived when Number 6 collapsed along with the rest of the World Trade Center on 9-11. Had the artifacts survived, they would have offered a material history of the textured richness of an immigrant community centered on the eponymous five-pointed intersection, which is now uh, the streets have changed names and location. The district's key public space with Paradise Square, just north of today's Moynihan Courthouse. Here's a re recreation of Paradise Square in the mid-19th century, and we've lost our video which would have been of Martin Scorsese's Gangs of New York, which in 2002 advanced the five-point story written by Herbert Asbury in, 18, in 1928. The film depicts Paradise Square as a vibrant poly, polyglot node, a place of public assembly and robust vox populi, as well as site of brutal confrontation between nativists and immigrants. Scorsese's movie poster makes the claim, America was born in the streets, this controversial notion locates urban struggle at center of American history. 
an urban narrative that runs counter to the popular frontier thesis, which held that the, that the American ethos was forged along the advancing frontier, a narrative that had a decidedly anti-urban context and subtext. And so we are left to consider, absent our video of an Occupy uh, moment, the proposition that America was born in the streets, that the proposition that America was born in the streets is embedded in the very archaeology of the global city. The NYPD Technical Assistance Response Unit, TARU, is ever ready to film protesters to inform the counter-terrorist awareness of domain. But to really know the city is to be constituted in and through its public domain. And to know the city is to, be, is to continue to strategize robust, transparent assembly as an antidote to encroaching security censures and erasures. And so now, Mr. Young, if you would like to carry on. How are we doing? Uh, we'd like to uh, discuss the antidote to rings of steel that are growing around the country. Am I doing okay? And um, that, that's our ongoing research that we've been working on now for almost 15 years, which are finding antidotes to the growth of, of security over the populace. And this is one example of what we're working on in our website, Cryptome, is a collection of documents for that. But we certainly don't think that that's the only way to go about it, that we think far better is to have public discussion and participation in this process. And that's because it's been that the there's been a huge industry growth since 911 in restricting security studies to groups that uh, pass classification for security, and that more and more the public is being cut out of this process. And we think that open discussion of this is what's needed to counter the business of security. And that is now the dominant industry right now, and that is getting even heavier push right now on the internet. So today, we'd like to at least foster some public discussion about the topic, about where we go next. Thank you, Deborah. Questions, comments are welcome. There's a mic, there's a mic back there somewhere if anyone wants to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.